Good afternoon. It's Monday the 1st of August 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. Now, Mike Robinson will be away for uh, the next couple of weeks, um, but I'm delighted to stay with you for the news. And today we're particularly pleased that we'll be joined by Dave Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. Uh, unfortunately, he has a small uh, Skype problem today, so we brought him in on an audio line, uh, which should work OK. We'll see how we get on. Well, before we bring Dave Ellis in to have a, have a talk about defence matters, we'd just like to say that we had an excellent British Constitution Group meeting at the Punchbowl pub in Nottingham yesterday. Um, it was well attended, and um, what took place at that meeting was a launch of um, an initiative, a key initiative, essentially to bring a state of law back to this country. And uh, it's very interesting that groups across UK and experts in the field of law are now starting to focus in on the fact that the key problem in this country is the rule of law has broken down. This, of course, has been driven through Westminster. And what we need to do to regroup the situation is to bring back the proper rule of law and in particular uh, common law and juries within our courts. Now, David, if you can hear me, you were present at the meeting yesterday. What was your impression of the meeting and some of the speakers? Uh, just brilliant to see so many people there. Uh, the speakers were of a very high caliber with regard to their, to their field and the amount of uh, research and diligence that they've done into whatever their particular fields were, whether that be mortgages, banking or whatever. But the, the overriding thing was, of course, that, that clearly from all of the people that attended that had come across problems uh, with the breakdown in, in law and law not being applied and uh, upheld properly, was that it didn't seem to make any difference from what their, from what their background or their geography was. It was common to everyone there. So that's very quickly, I think, for anybody listening to, to the people that are speaking, found it that actually this is quite reassuring, we're not on our own, and we've got a solution to this problem, and all we've got to do literally is just uh, keep going and get the truth out. Uh, well, that is, uh, that's a key statement, isn't it, to get the truth out. And as uh, somebody commented, the, uh, a lie started is uh, more than halfway around the world in no time at all. Um, the truth is a bit slower. Still getting its socks on for the race was the part of that quote. I'm sorry, I can't remember the originator of, of that particular quote, but uh, the lie starts moving around the world very quickly. It takes the truth time to get going. Uh, but it's it's obvious now that truth is starting to come up to the surface. And David, one of the key issues that was raised, of course, uh, was not only common law, it was to do with the issuance of money. And uh, I, I believe that you spoke to um, one of those present who was, um, of course, pushing for major change within the banking system and, of course, how we issue our own currency. Quite a long, 
uh, a long-established recipe and a long-established problem with the banking industry. And it's not... People, have made, people may, may well think that this is a new problem because the media has pushed it very hard since, you know, since over the last 10 years, since the, 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 the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac thing over in America where they tried to she just constantly ease into infinity. Uh, you know, they think it's a new thing and they're saying it's a global thing. It's not a global thing. It's totally the wrong word. You know, this is small groups that have tried to do this and they're using currency as a, as a control system and, a, and effectively a weapon. Uh, so, you know, we've got, some, we've got some very hard decisions to make as to how we, as a, as a, as a world, as a populace, deal with the variance between what's considered good for banking and what's considered good for people and democracy. And it's very different, you know, I can see, you know, that we, we can clearly see that, that that's what the problem is. But it's how that compromise is, is, is established. And this is where our politicians and our own people are breaking down because they're not doing their job. Uh, David, you couldn't put that clearer. Um, one of the points that came up was that we could no longer trust our politicians. It didn't matter what political party that they came from. And of course, se several members, um, several British Constitution members pointed out that part of the solution was to remove the whips from Parliament, uh, because, of course, these are the men and women who bully, cajole, and some would say blackmail their colleagues into following a particular line, um, whether or not that line is part of the wishes of their own constituents. So we've got the issue of how our parliament is run. But yes, it was fascinating to hear some of the historical background about how our banking industry has been manipulated in order to give uh, phenomenal power, put phenomenal power into the hands of, of just a few. And um, I can't remember the exact details. We will get, we'll get more information over the next few days. But somebody was pointing out that um, there were laws in existence which simply allowed banks to lie and commit fraud without the risk of being brought forth into a court to face charges. And it was particularly interesting to hear that against the background of Tom Crawford as just one example talking about fraud within the banking and the mortgage industry and uh, I was able to reinforce on that particular subject by saying that we recently uh, did a recorded interview with a banker who was resigned from his very senior position uh, because of what he regarded was uh, policy by the banks which was simply destroying people's lives or closing on loans particularly business loans uh, where he believed that there was still a workable business solution. So information coming to the surface about the banking industry, historical precedents, which the public's largely been unaware of. Uh, but of course, if we're really going to deal with it, uh, we've, got to, um, uh, we've got to force major change in Parliament, and in particular, the quality of our own MPs. Well, David, let's just uh, move on. I don't know whether you're aware of uh, one of the headlines today, but we'll put it under the, uh, the brief uh, genre of war and more war. Uh, but the Daily Mail getting particularly excited uh, because uh, a Russian MI8 helicopter has been shot down. And um, uh, as we might expect, um, a major article about the very gruesome deaths of the uh, Russian personnel who were on board. And to add a bit of uh, interest for the public, uh, we've got this uh, intrigue, which supposedly this, uh, they describe her as attractive blonde woman. Her details are found on part of a burnt ID card. And uh, we've had to label this ramp up the Russian monster and add intrigue. Uh, but if you can still hear me, of course, uh, Sorry, David, if you can still hear me, of course, um, the shooting down of uh, Russian helicopters can only take place with the modern weapons which have now been put into the Syrian field by Western governments. Uh, what, what's your feeling on, on uh, the UK and the US policy towards Syria at the moment? And we may have lost him. OK, in which case we'll we'll carry on through that. Uh, but I'll just add this to the top of that um, slide, if we can bring that one back on screen, please, uh, Theo. And uh, if, if you look for the source of this, 
information. What does the uh, uh, Daily Mail tell us? That the source comes from two activist groups, the Britain-based Syrian Observ uh, Observatory and the local coordination committees. Now, I've got observatory in there twice. I'll apologize for that. Um, but uh, the key point here is that the Syrian observatory is simply uh, based in a house in the Midlands. Nobody's quite sure of who the individuals are running that Syrian observatory. Nobody is sure of the validity of their information. But this is constantly uh, the main source of information used not only by the British government, uh, but also by mainstream press such as the Daily Mails. So what is actually going on here? Uh, we're not too sure. Well, let's move on to the saga of the Type 45s. And uh, many people sent this through over the weekend. Here was the headline, all of the Royal Navy's Type 45 destroyers in port, port at the same time. Now, it is true that over the summer period, uh, ships uh, do return to their home port. Uh, for normal leave routine and uh, usually associated maintenance. But let's have a look at some of the comments here in more detail. And these have all come through uh, from a Mr. Tom Sharp, the Directorate of Defence Communications. He said the scenario was unusual but not unprecedented and the ships could be docked from anything from a few weeks to a month. Um, a few weeks to a month. Well, he seems to be giving the same uh, time period there. If ships are coming in for leave, this is true. But it seems remarkable that all of the supposed top ships of the Royal Navy have come into port at the same time. He said it was not connected with the need for all six ships to be refitted with new engines, which broke down in the Persian Gulf because they were not designed for the hot water. Now, let's think about this. We've got billions of pounds worth of defence investment here, uh, but um, the British government, the Ministry of Defence, the engineers on this project, the senior military officers, none of them understood that the water in the Persian Gulf was warm. What a remarkable situation for Britain's defence industry in 2016. And... Uh, he emphasizes once again, it's just a coincidence that they're all in. That's nothing to do with the engines. And uh, then we get more reinforcement here that uh, the crew have got to take leave. And we've got manpower issues which are much publicized. It's got to be planned in advance. David, have we still got you or not? No, I'm here, Brian. Yeah. OK. Um, could you hear what I've, um, I've yeah, just... Yeah, I, I, I did. I mean, you've got... Uh, I mean, this is... Um... A very, you know, this is a problem that's been generated and it's been generated for quite some time. So it's not just the the political interface, policy making, and the engineering. There's quite a there's there's quite a recipe um, here with the way that those ships have been produced. So we're 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 fully we're fully into the integrated BAE uh, production here, and we've come away from the sort of old, the, the slightly older style of doing it with either Vickers or, or Camel Laird or Swan Hunter or whatever, where, they, where the ships were done in a, in a quicker fashion in, in specific yards. So those, that uh, daring um, group have had huge issues from its concept, right from the original uh, drawing up and the, and the work of the Horizon um, program that it took many, many years before they even laid a keel with millions and millions of pounds being spent on nothing actually happening at all. But hand in glove with it, we've got this nonsense of the way that they've been designed and produced. The engines clearly have severe issues. So we then look at uh, the two former first sea laws, but very recently uh, West and uh, Stanhope, um, trying to get Defence Committee to uh, uh, wake up and address the fact that we've got an engineering problem. As much as we've got naval shortages on the one hand, we've got engineering shortages on the other, but they've been generated. They don't just happen. They've been made like that. So for many years now, I've, I've, I've spoken to out in the West and we've had uh, conversations, you know, going back quite some years now, saying that, you know, we, you know, you see ships being cut, Lord West, but actually what's being cut is the engineering hand in glove. And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll end up with the, the shortening of both positions. So whilst we've got... Uh, Admiral Roger 
charge lane, not on the one hand saying, you know, the Royal Navy is supposed to be a silent service. You know, we're, we're losing this because all of this, uh, how can we say? I mean, basically at the moment, you know, if we wanted to be succinct, we'd say that the Royal Navy was moribund. It could not put to sea in anger. It's as simple as that. that those daring ships would never be able to, you know, I'm reliably informed from middle ranking officers who would be on them. Uh, and working them, saying that nobody really wants to take one out because it's a career game over, because they know the things don't work. If they have to take them out and actually do something, it's going to go horribly wrong. If they have to take them out down to Hormuz, for argument's sake, you know, and it's been put to me by then senior officers, you know, we're going, we're going to end up going down there, in, and the word they use was junk. Um, so, you know, what are we doing? The big picture is, of course, is that, the, is that it's not just the Royal Navy being shortened out, having its position shortened. It's just the nation's being shortened and, and having its position shorted. So we're being sold short. Uh, and this is a radically dangerous thing to be doing because we've got a lot of factions globally cooking and gearing for war. We're hearing this Russia, 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 war, war, war. We're having generals write, write books, General Richard Sharif writing a book, uh, writing papers on war with Russia, you know, and it's being used by the banking cabal for gearing towards, for gearing towards uh, some kind of ridiculous reset of, of currency and control. So, we've, you know, we've not got many people actually beating the correct narrative here. We've got Paul Roberts over in America, lots of independents, and, and the... And the and UK column and everybody else in your network, Brian. But there's not enough people actually saying the right stuff, and words count. I couldn't agree with that uh, more, and uh, particularly senior officers, retired senior officers who can speak out, are clearly too busy playing golf or chatting around the club room bar. Let's have a look at um, how this deception over the Royal Navy works, because at the moment, um, we are being told that the Royal Navy has plenty of ships, over 30 ships at sea. Well, if you go to the uh, Royal Navy website, you can have a look at some of these ships. And units such as, as these, which are principally training, um, training boats is probably the best description for the universities. These are being listed as if they are fully frontline major warships. It's quite remarkable. Uh, this is uh, part of the website here where we can see the Archer class. Now, these, these small vessels have a purpose, uh, but to suggest, as um, uh, we've called it the Ministry of Deception here, is trying to tell us that this is part of our fleet is complete and utter nonsense. So let's come back to that uh, report. Um, and uh, see what was said. This is the statement. This week, the Royal Navy had over, uh, sorry, this week, the Royal Navy had over 8,500 personnel deployed on operations around the world and 34 ships at sea. So if we have a look at statistics, uh, the Royal Navy at the moment has got 66 ships. Now, that's just surface ships. I've excluded submarines. Just 36% are major warships. This is proper warships, frigates, and destroyers. And of those, 33% are not fully operational. So we've got aircraft carriers that don't work properly. They haven't got the aircraft. The crews aren't, the air crews are not trained. Those ships are not fully operational. And then we've got the Type 45s that are not working. And then the statistic is that 41% of the surface fleet are just minor units. Effectively, these are toys. So, David, if we look at the true picture of the Royal Navy at the moment, we are being utterly lied to by the Ministry of Defence, and of course that means the government, over the scale of the cuts uh, which have been unleashed, particularly on the Royal Navy, but all three services. And we know that those cuts were unleashed in order to make it easier to draw the U United Kingdom into the EU military structure. Do, do you think some of the truth of this is finally beginning to hit home with some of the serving uh, senior military officers? There's the odd one or two, yes. Um, I mean, you've got to bear one thing in mind. A lot of these guys have massive portfolios, and some of them have corporate interests that, that scissor across various you know, big defence companies. But there's the odd one or two that don't, and the ones that don't are very, very short and succinct on this front. And I'm, I'm going to quote uh, a, 
a, a chief artist, artificer now. I just want a straight navy. And there was a, there seems to be a ground smell within the engineering uh, class in the navy that are sick to death of this problem because it's clearly being shortened out. I mean, they may see it as cuts or or whatever. You know, they're not. It, it, this is a policy direction, maybe well towards. Uh, can we get away with a uh, with joining the EU navy, which looks like it would be a Franco-German affair? Uh, and then what are we doing with that? Well, that's just gearing to have a go at, at Russia or, or whatever or Iran. You know, and this I've got to come back to the sort of the the, the, the British Constitution uh, group meeting yesterday, and that was one of the things that cropped up um, was that, that Napoleon, at, at the stage that he got some level of control, got hold of the accounts and the books and saw the magnitude of the national debt, and more importantly, who was carrying, who the debt had to be, was, was to. And you can clearly see that the prevarication at that stage, and he's, I'm unhappy about that, uh, resulted in Britain going to war with, with France, and the stocks then being shortened, not just across France, but then a lot of bankers making a huge amount of money off the blood of our blokes and the French blokes fighting at Waterloo. So I've got to see that we're, we're almost coming back to that sort of uh, model again. And my my biggest issue with the way that, I mean, I feel a little bit like sort of Samuel Pepys here at this stage, you know, running up to the to the Crown and going, I'm complaining about the state of the Navy, which, you know, my company has been trying to do now for, for several years. They've been falling upon deaf ears because they just frankly don't want to know. This isn't a question of just saying, oh, I want so many reams of rope or whatever. This, this is... This is pretty desperate stuff. If you want to look at the statistics, okay, so uh, the Belfast tied up in, in at the Thames, uh, HMS Victory, Caroline, and uh, whatever else you can think of, that uh, little World War I um, frigate that's tied up somewhere. What's the, that, what does that represent? 25% of the viable sailing fleet of the Royal Navy. Uh, because this is the magnitude we're talking about here, that, you know, how many actually ships work, you know, we, we know damn well that this, this nonsense with the destroyers and the delaying, Cameron and, and now Mrs May delaying on sorting that issue out, it's not just, you know, I mean, that is absolute blatant shorting of the position. So, you know, the, the, the guys in the, in the service are not daft, they can see the thing, and a lot of them are saying to me, we're not fighting another Washington war which is effectively, you know, we've not gone anywhere from the Iraq problem. Yes. So they're not daft. I think the guys in there have got it. But this is the, this is the dilemma, of course, is if they come out and leave the services, it then leaves, what, then leaves what's left in a very, very vulnerable position. And then the government could then potentially, let's say they could argue, that we have no choice but to run co-opted military union because, you know... They'll have, the, they'll have the argument at that stage. They'll be able to argue it. So it's a dreadful thing because, you know, where's the counter-narrative amongst the MPs saying what needs to be said? And they're just not saying it. You know, the Labour Party is in complete and utter disarray. You know, we've got, you know, probably the only, the only sort of counter-narrative that I'm familiar with politically is coming from Mike Hookham out of UKIP and his team. Um, you know, credit to them, but we need more. And... You know, we're just we're just not seeing the the, the, the common sense on this. You know, I mean, it, it's okay, David. Kind of I David, well, I'm going to say thank 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 you for that. Uh, we need our politicians to be acting clearly. They're not so the the uh, effort has got to come from the public. But let's uh, take this argument uh, through a little bit. And somebody in our chat box is picking up on the subject of uh, Brexit. Uh, this was sent through to me over the weekend, and it's a truly fascinating document, which I'll encourage people to have a look at. Uh, it's the 11th report of session from the House of Lords, the European Union Committee, the process of withdrawing from the European Union. Uh, so um, uh, this is a very interesting, to doc uh, interesting document to read now. Um, there were basically two expert witnesses used to give an opinion on European law in the House of Lords. We had a Sir David Edward, former judge of the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, totally independent, of course, and Professor Derek Wyatt, QC, Emetrius Professor of Law at Oxford University. And what these two gentlemen said 
in the most simplest form is that uh, before Article 50, a right existed for EU withdrawal under international law. The advantage of Article 50 was that once it was implemented, there was actually a procedure for withdrawal. That procedure had been defined. Um, they then looked at a question, is repeal of the European Communities Act 1972 a valid process? And their response was no. Article 50 uh, uh, is the only means of withdrawing consistent with UK's obligations under international law. And what was very clear from this document, uh, in the argument, there is no real mention of our constitutional and common law. Uh, none at all. So everything comes back to the fact that UK, according to these men, can only act if it relies on EU law and international law. Um, we have no mention of British Parliament binding its successors within the decision for the uh, European Union, which of course is not only unlawful, but is also treasonous. So I'd be grateful if there's any members of our audience who would like to look into this particular document further. These are the two gentlemen concerned, Sir David Edward here. Uh, but interestingly enough, we've got uh, Professor Derek Wyatt circled, um, who was speaking um, uh, on BBC, recorded video by the BBC, Lord's European Union Committee meeting. But for some strange reason, this episode has been withdrawn. We don't know why that is. Um, but it's clear that neither of these selected experts appear to understand the constitutional common law. We would like to ask why were they chosen, who chose them, and does the constitutional integrity uh, of the country really rest on the views of these two men? So if anybody can help us with more research around uh, that particular issue and um, uh, what we've been reading in the chat box as the program's been proceeding is that it seems that there is now movement inside the House of Lords to block Brexit. And of course, this completely ties in uh, with what the UK column has been saying over many, many months, that there was no plan to leave the European Union. Uh, the idea was to cause confusion, to delay, delay and delay. And now we're seeing yet further signs of efforts to block that and further stall the process. Well, what's coming under the surface? And if our armed forces are being cut to the bone, um, we are seeing the rise of private security companies, enter G4S. And uh, this is a very interesting article, which has only appeared in two more minor uh, media groups. And uh, what it is saying is that G4S has just been awarded the contract to run the Equality Advisory and Support Services Helpline. Um, now, this has been contested quite strongly. The helpline uh, supposedly helps people facing discrimination, uh, but it's been given to a security company, G4S, following recommendation by the House of, uh, House of Lords Committee. Uh, the comment on this was the following, to ensure the service can continue and is run as effectively and efficiently as possible, we ran an open and competitive tender process to identify who is best to take it forward. Following this, G4S has been successful and subject to contract. It will be running the service for three years from October 2016. So we have now got a major global security company which is going to be providing helpline, we will say, on some pretty sensitive issues. Trust us, uh, we're G4S. Well, have a look at the following articles here. Uh, we've got the Lincolnite uh, reporting that uh, there's going to be some redundancies. The private security firm delivering back office functions the Lincolnshire Police has become ask sorry has begun asking its staff to consider a voluntary exit from the company, and of course a voluntary exit is redundancy. So let's remember what we know about G4S: a disaster over security around the Olympics. Uh, article after article in the mainstream press and media about mismanagement. We have death of individuals in their care. 
uh, we have complaints about the treatment of asylum seekers. And, and I think this comment is uh, particularly relevant from uh, Zoe Williams of The Guardian. What I know for certain is that outsourcing like this is the worst kind of capitalism all the complacency of secure government business, uh, all of the rapacity of unfettered, the unfettered market. So here we are handing more and more power to um, private security companies. The public has absolutely no recourse to, an, to a route for questioning them. More and more power being given to unaccountable private companies. And we're going to reinforce this by this particular um, article from Financial Times. And here they're pointing out that it's only a very small logo on a police epaulette that spells out the difference between the police and G4S. So police resources cut to the bone, used as an excuse for outsourcing to these very powerful and dangerous companies. And here's the headline taken from Vanity Fair, the chaos company. Uh, wherever governments can't or won't maintain, or, uh, maintain order, from oil fields in Africa to airports in Britain and nuclear facilities in America, the London-based global security behemoth G4S has been filling the void. It's the world's third largest private sector employer and commands a force three times the size of the British military. So against the cuts that we've just uh, been talking about with David Ellis, we've now got the emergence of totally unaccountable private corporations who have the power of three times uh, the, the British Army, effectively. And uh, this is a very dangerous position. It hasn't occurred by accident. This has been policy put forward deliberately by our own government. Well, if the police can't uh, act alone and they need G4S to support them, uh, things are getting worse because apparently the cost of keeping Britain's children safe is expected to climb over three billion pounds. And here's the article from The Guardian. And uh, we have a QC, Vera Baird. And um, what has she got to say? Well, she said that basically the growing cost of tackling exploitation of children could treble to three billion a year by 2020. And, it's, and she's calling for the Home Office to investigate. She says the police are struggling to cope with a huge escalation in the number of child sexual exploitation cases and fears that it may grow to threaten other aspects of effective policing. And she's come out with this comment as in her role of chair of police commissioners. So, um, this was particularly pertinent. The Home Secretary may wish to consider this as a matter of urgency to ensure forces are adequately resourced to deal with these investigations and provide care for victims. There is no care, of course, uh, for police whistleblowers because we know from our own uh, gentleman who spoke to the UK column recently that he has been uh, subjected to particularly vicious harassment, threats and bullying via the Metropolitan Police simply for daring to speak out and talk about the cover-up of industrial scale child abuse in London. Is it getting better with um, the Goddard inquiry? Well, it appears not because several papers are reporting today that uh, she's confused over the law. Uh, she says that she doesn't really understand local laws. She's not too well up on English law, but this is the woman who's been put in charge of uh, a child abuse inquiry. Uh, she's asked somebody to explain the local laws to her. She's spent a mere £18 million to date with no uh, substantive, substantive evidence being taken from any of the child abuse victims. Uh, Melanie Shaw, a key child abuse whistleblower, remains in prison. Uh, she's now in her ninth week segregated in order to, quote, protect the public. We know that Mickey Summers, um, uh, who has uh, been through terrible abuse himself, is now able to expose the evidence to show the drugging of children in care for the, for the purposes of abuse in other Nottingham care homes. And um, if we just uh, bring this one in the Met, 
police whistleblower, of course, has not been called forward to the Goddard inquiry. And, uh, and uh, he's already been accused of mental illness and ha have, has had his pay cut. Could it uh, get worse? Well, we think it probably could. And we need look no further than the Scottish um, named person scheme. Here we are, Herald Scotland. Kevin McKenna uh, is now reporting in a, in a commendable article saying that the named person scheme has shown SNP to be at its worst. So if we have a look at what this man says, amongst other things, he says that Christian groups were jeered and intimidated in a manner which uh, uh, raised some questions about some of the influences that hold sway in the SNP party. It was a wretched, wretched response. Many of these people would have previously been well disposed to the idea of Scottish independence. Uh, but McKenna here says, bang, goes another tranche of political supporters. So the SNP is a party whose language of spin uh, is, is a Caledonian version of Orwellian doublespeak. And the other thing we better bring on screen is that uh, the first thing a totalitarian, totalitarian regime does uh, is to get at the children, to distance them from the subversive, varied influences of their families and indoctrinate them in their ruler's view of the world. So I'd encourage people to go and have a look at this article because it is uh, very clear that uh, more than a few people are now starting to understand the pure danger of the named person scheme. And we should see that being uh, projected as a solution to the massive crisis in child abuse, uh, which has come up as a, uh, and we are seeing through the failed Goddard inquiry. So create the problem with the abuse and then attempt to bring in the named person scheme uh, in order to produce a solution. And if that isn't bad enough, can we end here, which is of a remarkable school in Scotland, the Michaela School, which was highlighted to us um, from two angles. One, it's being promoted as where education needs to go. Uh, but as we're about to see, there are some rather strange things going on in this school. So uh, here is the headmistress, and uh, she's been speaking out in a great number of um, uh, media environments. Uh, these are some of the uh, images off uh, the school's website and little video clips promoting it. And we're particularly interested with this gentleman. And here he is, Mr. Barry Smith, assistant head and head of languages. Now, why have we got an interest in this school? Well, somebody kindly sent us this letter. And uh, basically, it says that the deadline for the term's lunch payments was the 1st of June 2016. And this particular person is told they are one week overdue. Uh, you're currently £75 in arrears. If this full amount is not received within this week, your child will be placed into, quote, lunch isolation from Monday the 13th of June. They will receive a sandwich and a piece of fruit only. They will spend the entire 60 minutes period in lunch isolation. Now, we know that parents should pay the uh, meal fees. We know that some parents can't pay those fees. Uh, but what appears astonishing is this school punishes children by put, placing them in isolation for the failure of the parents to pay for those meals. And uh, what the person pointed out to us who kindly sent us a copy of this letter is here is the school being promoted uh, effectively by the government as being a um, leader in the education of children but clearly they are prepared to employ some pretty vicious policies uh, if the parents and the children don't get things right. So here is uh, the headmistress again um, speaking out on a Channel 4 programme, and she was challenging a lady who'd taken her children out of school to take them on holiday. Clearly we can't have children spending time with their parents over and above school. And uh, here is Boris Johnson, um, basically promoting the school and saying that uh, this is the type of education the city needs. So we would like to say, is this your city you're talking about, Mr. Johnson? Is it your bankers? 
your corporate globalists, your city state, children to be taught to your values. So we'll leave our audience to decide what's really going on here, but we see something particularly nasty coming to the surface in education. And uh, without taking you into too much of a dark space, we'll end on the light note, which is that you can now get your supermarket groceries and support witchcraft, as ASDA has been uh, very keen to promote the launch of the latest Harry Potter book. Well, that's the UK column news for today. Thank you very much for joining me. I will be back at the same time tomorrow. Take care, do your own research and uh, check everything we're talking about as events unfold in UK. Thank you. Bye bye.